Oh, it says we're now streaming live on YouTube. Yay. Yes, it's just not in the right spot. Oh, is that the problem? Yeah. Ooh, okay. Let's see if you can get us in the right spot. Yes. Okay, are we in the right spot now? <laughs> hold on, hold on. Okay. Okay, there. Um, I'm just muting the YouTube really quickly. Okay. So I am, I'm going to hide myself from our Zoom. Okay. And then I'm going to let you guys get on with it. Okay. Um, and I'm going to post this out. If you can also post this out to, to Facebook really quick. Okie doke. I certainly will. Uh, let's see, where's the little Facebook one? Because I have to go find the event. And I will post it into the other face, into the YouTube one. Okay. I'm trying to find the event link so I can do it there. Where's the event link? I know I posted to it earlier. All my events. There we are. There we go. And I'll go post in here. There we go. <laughs> okay, I posted. And you're still on there, uh, Melissa. Are you going dark yet? I am dark. Oh, because I can still see you. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, okay, hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to... Uh, Condex by Condor. Uh, sorry about that. We had some uh, technical difficulties uh, trying uh, this for the first time. But again, welcome and welcome to our guest, Elle McKinney. Uh, Elle, thank you for uh, joining us here uh, for Condex. And um, thanks for having me. It's great to have you. So um, I've been reading your uh, book which I'm so far I'm enjoying uh, very much. And if you would like to uh, tell everyone uh, out there uh, and on YouTube uh, watching us, uh, what inspired you to uh, do a Blade So uh, Black? Yeah, um, so I tell the story a lot. It was really a combination of a few things. Uh, back in the olden times before you know we were all stuck at home um i was at my mom's house i was watching supernatural reruns i was sitting on her couch and they were hunting vampires and one of them made some sort of quip about buffy or in reference to buffy and um earlier that day disney had announced that they were going to do a live action version of alice in wonderland and uh, my initial thought in response to that was nobody asked for this um, but then that idea started knocking around with, you know, what I had been watching. And so I wrote a fight scene and the fight scene eventually became, uh, more and I added to it and we got the first draft of A Blade So Black, which was essentially, uh, the Winchesters and me questioning Disney's choices. <laughs> it's always fun when you, when you get a kernel of something you never know what what's going to spark spark a story so um you have a you have two books out in the series now correct with the third that's coming out yes the third one which is a council cursed which will end the trilogy uh that starts the series for the nightmare verse books um comes out next year and uh it will complete alice's journey thus far so are there more than planned after this uh 
this trilogy then? Well, we do get a prequel, um, and it's a lot of people are like, "Oh, is it a prequel back during the 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 war and everything with Hada and the group?" And it's like, "No, not yet. This one is after the war still, but it's before Alice. Um, it takes place in um, 1880s, 1890s uh, Whitechapel, London, where um, the locals are kind of worried about you know something going on. People are getting ripped apart." And it stars, um, we get to see the Duchess and we get to meet Baudelaire, who is this, uh, her version of um, a dreamwalker at that point in time. And they get to go investigate what's going on because the Duchess is like, that's not a person doing that. That's a nightmare. We have to go stop it. So that's how we get that story. And uh, hopefully we'll get more from the past with Hatta and the group and all that. Um, but as of right now, just wanted to, see what it would be like to explore this world still from human eyes but not necessarily Alice's. Well that must be what I was looking at on your uh, web page then when I saw that there was another book in the Mirror uh, series. Is that the Mirror series is actually something else altogether. Uh, that is with uh, four authors total. It's myself, uh, Julie C. Dow, Danielle Clayton, and Jen Cervantes. And um, the Broken Wish just came out this month by Julie, and it's available now, and it follows uh, Magic Mirror, this family heirloom, through time, uh, through these four generations of this family, and all that ensues with that. So hers is currently out right now. Go get it. It's amazing. Uh, mine won't be out till much, much later because I'm <laughs> writing the fourth one. <laughs> so there's two two more books before mine, so it'll be a few years beforehand. Um, but that's the one that I will be writing, and it will be set like right now. Julie's is set in 1800s Hanau, Germany. I think I'm pronouncing that correctly. I apologize if I'm not. Um, and then mine is set in 2003 uh, New York, and mostly because you know I was like I'm kind of scared of historicals because there's a lot of research and a lot of stuff you can get wrong but i guess now 2003 technically counts as historical i, I don't know that makes me feel weird and old um well, but, it's a yeah. historical that you've lived through <laughs> well yeah like i get that advantage like i get the advantage of i was i was there here on the planet when that was happening um that timeline and everything so i don't have to do a whole lot of research but still uh, so that that's what the mirror is, which so I am a equally collaboration, excited about. Not a collaboration because your each story is is standalone. Correct. We we all sort of we read each other's books and we give notes because there are threads that have to be woven through the entire right. series. Right. Like, but like a, overall, right. A, a collaboration that is not a collaboration because each story stands alone. But yeah, you have to all agree on how the universe is actually working for continuity, obviously. That's really interesting, though. Uh, wow, that's that's cool. Um, I also saw that you uh, do, uh, or you've done a script for a graphic novel, because you, you yes, this, right? but you you did the script for a graphic novel. I'm really excited about that as well. Um, it's Nubia, real one for DC Comics. It is a young adult graphic novel um, set in sort of like an alternate world where all of you know these iconic heroes we get to see them during their teen years you know becoming who they are as a person before they become who we know them as in the comic book world and i was super thrilled to get a chance to write nubia who is wonder woman's twin sister um she is you know this powerhouse um or at least the version that i fell in love with you know back before uh, we got crisis and a lot of you know things went by as it tends to happen in comic books you know one day they're like mm, this isn't working out so well and then i don't know yeah, something just, breaks everything before and, and rewrite it oops that didn't work let's just go yeah like that this is like, we're gonna retcon some things we're gonna try some new things which i mean that's the beautiful thing about comics um unfortunately nubia kind of got left behind and fans have been you know clamoring for to see who sh her as who she was, you know, pre-crisis, because uh, we've gotten a few versions since then, but never have she's gotten back to her original, you know, like status as who she was, princess of the Amazons, equal to the Wonder Woman, uh, actually more powerful than the Wonder Woman, because she was, you know, one of the only ones who could put Diana on her backside repeatedly and did 
Um, so it it's really cool to get to explore that character and see her as a young person because that's one thing we didn't get with those even pre-crisis. So I'm, I'm really excited about that. Uh, honestly, as much as I love comics and I did see did get some Wonder Woman comics when I was a little girl and watching Wonder Woman and stuff like that, I would. I think it's a real disservice that most of us didn't even know Nubia existed. I, I saw this beautiful piece. At first, I thought it was a cosplay, and then I realized it was a piece of artwork that one artist had done. It's a very lively in in more of the modern movie outfit. I said, "Well, that's a beautiful cosplay. She makes a beautiful one." And I wonder what that market. And then I started reading, and it's like Nubia. And then I looked her up. It's like she's existed this long, and. I felt kind of cheated that we didn't know more, that more people don't know about her. And it's like, why do these characters just get kind of, it's like a little bit here, a little bit there, but it seems a lot, uh, there's a lot of characters that get that, but I, I, I thought that was a real disservice to the character that so few of us even knew about her. Uh, that would be the feeling that a lot of us have, um, you know, cause she was around before I was born, you know, so I, grew up reading about like Vixen and Storm and, you know, uh, Bumblebee and and all these great characters not knowing, you know, that Nubia existed and but that Marvel. Nubia technically is the the um, first black woman hero in comics. Right. So, Marvel was a little more forthright with their uh, diverse cast earlier on. than uh, Well, just... Nubia came before right. Storm. Uh, but then we lost her when cri pre like the crisis on infinite earths happened and uh comics because i guess you know it had gotten unwieldy there's so much going on and no it it's all everywhere so you, you got to kind of compress it if you want to tell a cohesive story and nubia was a casualty of that um and we've had great comics since you know you got vixen like i said she's one of the ones that i really really enjoy um and you get one version of oh what is the crimson something i'm forgetting the name i'm drawing a blank but they start out like this guy who has these magic guns essentially <laughs> um and there's a version that's a black woman her name is jill and she's amazing as well and so there's there's all these iterations that happen and um it was just like for me seeing Nubia come back as this version and that version, like she's a guard here, or she's just a really powerful Amazon there, or she's on the council to the queen here, uh, but never who she was pre-crisis, which is, you know, the version that we all fell in love with and the version of her at her most powerful. Um, so it's it's been an honor to be able to sort of dip back into that and be like, yes, Wonder Woman does have a sister. This is her. And, and I hope we all get to see more of her because it, we really should see more of her. And like I said, the, the artwork that the one lady did was just phenomenal. I, I actually went and Share, shared some of the pictures to some of my friends. Uh, one of my uh, friends is comic book artist Joe Phillips. I don't know if you're familiar with who he is. Um, do you know who Joe is? He, no, his work. <laughs> work. <laughs> like I haven't met personally. He, he's great, and his brother Lex are they're they're a crack up. Um, but yeah, Joe. Because I knew Joe and uh, Lex would obviously very much appreciate something. Like that. I I was kind of disappointed. Matter of fact, I'm probably going to have to poke Joe and go, hey, Joe, you're doing all these other characters. Why haven't you done Nubia? <laughs> because he does do some of the DC characters for some of his artwork. But he, he's creating a new comic book right now, uh, an independent one that he's doing that's got a, a lot of diverse cast and a lot more. Well, because he, of course, is uh, Black. So he's his new comic book has a lot more Black heroes in it, which is really cool. And, and it's good to see people doing stuff. I, I remember years ago when somebody finally did like one word that wasn't from DC or Marvel that had a Native American and stuff like that, but more diverse characters and heroes from all these different traditions. And the world is diverse, so it is nice to see a diversity. And, and for myself growing up, especially since I grew up in Oregon where um, 
I learned things about my state after I left it that were not very pleasant, were not very pleasant at all. Um, I, I knew that there weren't any blacks in, in Oregon until around World War II. The reason for that, I didn't know. And that, it, it, that was a real shock finding that out. Um, but being in a place that was extremely white, even though we did have some Japanese and some of the Native Americans and literally only a handful of black people around me. I learned things that I had to unlearn, especially when I went into the Navy. And what you, it, it, when you're sharing, sharing a birthing with a whole bunch of people, <laughs> you, you, learn, you, you learn to leave some of that stuff behind because you start to learn who people really are. So I would love to see more diversity in our entertainment because it's really, it really is what the world is. And so many of us get this input that doesn't reflect our world. And we need more stories. We, mean, we need more stories from people like you and others. And hearing your voices. And like I said, I can actually, after sharing a birthday with all those, all those women, I can, I can hear those tones <laughs> when, when she get when she gets, uh, when she gets on her, uh, you know, that that added that that attitude that comes comes through. It comes through, and I can hear it because I've I've heard I've heard that. So, great great job on char on characterization in your book. Thank you. So how how has it been? I mean, it's already harder for women to break into a publishing, or anything. Even though there's a lot of women in it, I mean, women are already already have a harder time in in the media compared to men. How, how has your experience been as a woman of color as well trying to break in? Well, it's been, um, I'd say interesting because there have been good things, clearly. You know, I'm here, the books are here, uh, things are happening with the stories and I'm always jazzed about that. Um, but you can't ignore how difficult it was and still is uh, because, you know, you, you have people as recently as three years ago saying that putting um, black characters on covers, the books wouldn't sell because nobody wants to buy those stories, right? Um, which is odd because the um, largest reading demographic running for quite a while now has been black women and girls so either i mean it's not a question i know that you're lying to yourself publishing about following the market because the market you're trying to cater to is not the market reading the most books so um there's just just this thing with how things have always been done you know, it's tradition that this is the market that you cater to and nobody takes the time to think about why that's tradition. Um, it didn't start out just being this is the things that, you know, this is how it was. No, you made it that way specifically. Um, and, you know, there would be myself uh, being a black woman, I and others and would hear we have our one black girl book for the year. You can't have more than one. Sorry, can't have more than one. Um, <laughs> right, or you would hear, there were people who would hear we have our one Asian boy book for the year. Or we have our one uh, Latina book for the year. Like you, it didn't matter if it was the same genre or not, which is normally what you would hear is like hearing, oh, we have an Alice in Wonderland retelling. We can't take on another one. That okay, I get that, but we have our one black girl. So your black girl book is about probably something from Jim Crow or something, because that's mostly what publishing was interested in hearing about was stories of black pain and struggle, you know, slavery, that sort of thing. Um, but then you have romance and adventure over here and it's not, you can't take, okay. And there's still this issue of which books publishing will push more than others. Um, and you'll hear from authors like Angie Thomas and Nick Stone, who do these stories about police brutality and racism. And these are very important stories, but you can hear it in their voices and see it on their faces that these aren't the only books that they want to write. They're tired of those types of books being, you know, timely. They would love it if those books didn't have a message that was relevant, because that would mean that Black people are being treated the way they should be treated in the world. Um, so it's been a struggle. 
And even now, recently this summer with the publishing paid me hashtag, you find out that authors, uh, white authors who are writing black characters are getting paid four or five times as much as black authors who are writing the same, but obviously more authentic story because it's something that we've lived. Um, and that came out and showed that, you know, it's just like, these are the books, like our books are on published on the shelf, but we're not being paid as equally as our colleagues um, for the same stories. And, and it's, and it's a lot. So I, I could go on for hours. <laughs> I, I have gone on for hours. If I you watch you my Twitter at all, yes, I have. I've even I, on, I I've talk about this on a your lot. Twitter. So I, I've even commented on your Twitter. I, I, I remember the one where you, where you said you had your readers told you you need to explain why the braids hurt. It's like I've had my hair put in a French braid and a tight French braid and it pulls on your scalp. I can't imagine all those tiny little braids have got to pull all six ways of Sunday on your skin. It's, it's, it's so interesting just seeing how, and, but it's also like I've, t I've spoken with other black um, writers and writers in color in, in general that it's just this, we have, and when I say we, I mean society, have been trained to a degree that this is the type of narrative, you know, because uh, the first four books that I wrote for three and a half because I didn't finish one of them um, before I published Alice because Alice is the, not the first book that I wrote but it is the first book that got published well those first three stories were about white boys because that's what I thought you had to write in order to be published because that's all I read um, in the genre that I wanted to write in which was urban fantasy young adult and it wasn't until my sisters started having kids and they started falling in love with the same genres and reading comic books and reading those type of books. So as I'm going, there will be at least one book in this genre for my babies to read if I have anything to say about it. Um, and I didn't realize until afterwards that that writing Alice was, I, I was also giving myself permission to be the hero in my own story for the first time because it had never occurred to me until then that I could do that because I didn't like my schools we didn't learn about Octavia Butler we didn't read you know Toni Morrison we read The Hobbit and I greatly enjoyed The Hobbit you know um but these weren't books that I was exposed to until college because while my parents like we had you know Alec Baldwin and such we had black authors in my house but my parents didn't read science fiction and fantasy so we didn't have those types of books um so it, it, it's just now you know everybody's like oh well it's getting better well yes but it's getting better very slowly like when a blade so black came out for a young adult i was one of four books about black girls written about written about black women of the thousands of books that came out in 2018 there were four of us um now in 2019 and 2020 you know we have more but it's still enough that we can all almost name each other because there's still enough that we can keep track mostly, you know, in the back of our minds, such and such has, even if I don't know the title, I know such and such has a book coming out this year, next year, but you can't do that with authors, you know, uh, with white authors or white books. You, you can't keep track of everybody. And until we get to that point, it's, yeah. So there is progress can't deny that there's progress. The progress is entirely too slow, in my opinion. Um, everyone who's in charge of publishing is an adult. And if this was actually a priority, it could look different next year. But we're still four years, five years after We Need Diverse Books became a thing. It's still, you know, an issue. Now we're fighting about the fact, you know, the New York Times bestseller list, which we know has been a scam, is also a racist scam. So it's... It, it's the fight moves on to different things okay now we're on the shelves now pay us equally you know now we're on the shelves now boost us equally so it, it never stops unfortunately and as you gain ground in one place you notice just how uneven that ground is once you get there it it takes a lot of wind out of your sails but at the same time when i go to 
a school or a conference and I meet the kids who are reading the books, who are seeing themselves, or I take a picture where there's a, I have lots of pictures. One is my favorite. I've got like a little top hat and I'm in a yellow, I, I, a friend of mine, she calls me an angry bumblebee because I have on black and yellow <laughs> and um, it's kind of punk looking. There's you no know, fishnet involved. Um, but I'm surrounded by a bunch of black girls who are in high school who are holding the book and they're all excited about it. So it's moments like that make it worth it. Moments like, you know, um, where my grandfather, I have giant frames of each cover because I'm extra like that. <laughs> and um, he wanted so So he has them in his house and he's, you know, there's a picture I have where he's just looking at one of them and he's so proud. But, you know, moments like that are what keep me going. I'm glad you were, you're able to have those moments and that those uh, kids are able to have those moments with those characters that look like them, sound like them, and have their experiences. Because I know, like, I, the media even, when they get hold of characters, they change their ethnicity rather than actually casting the ethnicity. I, I can honestly be being mad when Sci-Fi Channel did... Uh, Ursula K. Le Guin's Earth Sea, because although he, he's supposed to be dark skin, they're not necessarily like African Americans, but they're supposed to be dark like that. And they cast a blonde, a, a, a blonde, wide white guy, and it's like, that's not Jed, that's not Sparrowhawk. And Hollywood and, and media misses the chances of representation all the time, even when authors, even white authors like Ursula K. Le Guin, who had a lot of black characters in her stories, or not necessarily, like I said, Jed isn't, wouldn't have the same experiences because he's from another world, but he's dark-skinned. He's not supposed to be fair. Uh, in Left Hand of Darkness, of course, most of the people on that planet were, looked more like black people, so they send the one, uh, Hainish representative they send is black skin, but of course he's so far in the future they don't have those experiences anymore. That it, it, it's the future where hopefully we are are all more equal. So you know she did she wasn't speaking to to your experience experiences of black, people, but she was including people like that. But when we get to media, a lot of this a lot of this diversity that was put in books goes away and, it, and that, that's a shame I, and even in the comic books the diversity that's there when it goes to screen goes away and it shouldn't go away because we already know who those characters are so it, I, there's a great disservice in that that cuts out a lot of people um, look how long it took to do a, a serious comic book movie with, with, a, with a black lead and mostly black cast I, I, I still, uh, I'm embarrassed to say, I still haven't seen Black Panther because of my schedule that hadn't allowed me to, but it's on my list of one of the and I'm really sad that we've lost the actor that spoke to so many people, and to know that he did that and did all that while he was sick, so sick, is just phenomenal, and I'm, I'm sure a lot of people will be missing him for a very long time, although I have heard rumors are at least going to pass it on to Shuri, which is good because I think it would be bad to recast his iconic role. Um, how do you feel about the media and what, what they do do? I'm probably probably more disappointed than I could even be. Well, I mean, it's, it's one of those things where it's, for a while you were sort of not numb to it, but you weren't surprised. Like the fact that gods of Egypt is a thing that has happened in the past five years still like it feels like a million years ago because 2020 feels like it's a million years old like it's been going for forever but um it just goes to show just how little despite what they say a lot of these companies actually view as important and who they view as important as part of their audience or who they're trying to court or who they want to show, you know, as having a story to tell. Because one of the things with publishing and then with these other stories is when you have this um, dearth of representation or you have 
uh, with like with publishing paid me showed who was getting how much you know money versus who wasn't it shows which stories are seen as valuable and which stories are seen as universal right because I mean I get it books publishing is a business um Hollywood is a business people want to be in this to make money well they view particular stories as the ones that are lucrative because those are the ones that they've always made or and then when one story doesn't you know, you, you have a black story and it doesn't do as well as you would want. Um, they're like, see, all black stories are gonna be like, well, it could just be that that one wasn't shot very well or the writing wasn't that good or y'all didn't market it, which is a, it's like a self-fulfilling prophecy when you have a movie or a TV show or a, or a book and you don't market it and then people don't show up. You're like, see, didn't make money. And like, well, you didn't tell people it was a thing. So when you start caring enough to put money into the project, and then if it doesn't do what is expected of it, you still move on to the next you know, story and you put money into that project regardless, because there, I can point to even in the Marvel franchise, the ones that would be considered a flop, the other movies still got made. Like they just didn't stop making Marvel movies because one of them didn't do well, right? So you need to do the same thing with the these stories. Um, and I, I think it's like, you could kind of tell that um, Marvel didn't really expect Black Panther to do as well as it did because he would have been featured much more prominently in Infinity War and Endgame um, if they knew how popular he was gonna be, you know? Um, and I know from working at Hallmark, uh, cause I wrote cards at Hallmark for a while and I was writing cards at Hallmark when Black Panther became a thing. And for months, Leading up to the release of the movie, I was like, so are we going to write Black Panther cards? Because I was on the team that, you know, wrote for superheroes, for kids, for adults. Um, I'm like, we have eight Spider-Man cards and no Black Panther cards. Are, are we going to, there are 19 Batman cards. Can somebody, can we please? So the, we didn't get the go ahead to even start working on those cards until weeks after the movie had come out and it was a smash hit and then the company is like oh well yeah we should we should maybe make black panther cards so the first black panther cards from hallmark didn't hit shelves until may when myself and other uh, black writers and other black uh, people within the company and just other comic people within the company who just who knew you know or were poking at it we weren't listened to. And you can tell that people did not expect it to be as popular as it was because people do not expect um, Black people to consume comics or to consume fantasy or to consume, you know, there's this stereotype that certain stories aren't Black because they've been predominantly white. And I'm like, well, that's because that's the choice that y'all made. Not that we don't like to participate. I've loved comics all my life. We've loved video games all our lives. We've loved all of these forms of media all our lives. We've just never seen ourselves. So it's the idea that, like I said earlier, um, you know, with black women and girls being the highest reading demographic, if you actually paid attention to the numbers instead of to the numbers you want, you would notice that no, we're we're here and we our money spends just as well. too bad they didn't listen to you guys so you could have more stuff before the movie came out and you would think we talked about that so passive aggressively <laughs> for so long us other writers we were like hmm, we kind of missed the bus on that oh people bought all sorts of you know black panther whatever but uh sucks to be you hallmark i'm sorry i, I it When, when you look at how many movies have failed to say that, like you said, just because the tiny little pittance that they put out fails going C, when we've got more failures even on the other side, it, it is a poor attitude. And you're right, a lot of times it's the story wasn't good or the acting wasn't good. The special, special effects, you can ignore if the story and, and the acting are good. But if... Uh, the story isn't good. It 
it's not going it's not even going to resonate with its intended audience obviously because that's what you that's what happens anyway mm. It's it's funny to me, um, like even with the success of what Marvel is and everybody's like, oh, Black Panther is the first. And I'm like, well, yes, Black Panther is the first in the Marvel Cinematic Universe to have a black lead for a comic book movie. And it is also the first to have a predominantly black cast. And as much as I love the Iron Man movies, um, for what we know as comic movies currently, the MCU started with Iron Man, but those types of movies didn't start with Iron Man because you had the Spider-Man movies before that. And then before that, you had Blade. The Blade movies were the start of the modern comic movie, in my opinion. And Blade is a Black character. The role was helmed by a Black actor. And they were popular enough to go for three movies. Like, they showed um, studios, yeah, this comic thing can... It can it can be done, and people don't give it the due for for that happening to the black comic character that made it happen. Like they go right, and as like I said, as I'm Team Iron Man all the way, but Iron Man isn't what showed this was popular. Iron Man was the hail mary pass for the MCU overall, but I don't think they would have even thought it was possible to do that if they hadn't seen the success that they saw with Blade followed up by you know then spider-man so um it's it's really interesting that the one black movie in all of mcu is the one that they kind of you know uh just just sort of uh underestimated when a black comic character is who got this whole shebang started and of course spider-man only recently got brought back into the MCU because of Sony being bought pretty much by uh, Disney. And I guess X-Men is finally going to be integrated now, which of course a lot of the black characters in the MCU are more in uh, in X-Men because of the X-Men has a lot of, has a diverse cast already compared in a sense it's an ensemble of people from all over the place. So it'll be interesting to see what happens as they integrate uh, X-Men back into the MCU, especially since they've already messed with a few of the characters because they wanted them, but they were, but they were tied to the X-Men, but they brought them in anyway, uh, such as Scarlet Witch and uh, Quicksilver, which kind of got a strange treatment in, in the thing. It was kind of funny seeing two Quicksilvers, one, one in the X-Men movies and one, <laughs> one in the... That's the beauty and the curse of comics, man. Oh yeah, alternate dimension. <laughs> this story, this story's lines here, and this storyline's there. They do it all the time, and yep, and then they go collapse it all and start again. Yeah, it happens all the time, all the time, all the time. I, I was actually working in a comic book shop and planning on buying one back when some of the uh, resets were happening uh, because it was Age of Apocalypse was going on and DC had just done the thing where they had gone to zero on everything and it basically destroyed all the other Earths. So yeah, it's like I, I was in a comic book shop thinking about buying a comic book shop during, during all of that, which was kind of an interesting time in, com in comics. And you still had a lot of the strong alternate comics going on. It really, really in their strength at that time. And uh, Dark Horse didn't even belong. It was still pretty much, was just integrating with uh, DC because it had really been more of its own thing. So yeah, it was a, lo a lot of stuff was going on when I almost bought a comic shop. So I, I was very aware of what was going on during that time and more so than I've been before or since, but I've always loved comics because uh, the visual is, is great. Um, do you think any of your uh, books, other than doing Nubia, do you think any of your others will become graphic novels? Oh, I hope. I love graphic novels. Um, I think it would be great to see uh, the Nightmareverse as a graphic novel series, just because of how the visuals will be able to pop. Mm -hmm. um, anything I write in the future, I think would be great to be converted to graphic novel. Uh, just because, I mean, anything that helps 
you know, kids read anything that leads to kids being able to grasp the story, uh, maybe more deeply or just at all, because we're not not everybody reads or consumes the story in the same way. Um, so I, I would love for there to be a graphic novel, prose, audio, all of that, of everything, all the time, uh, just for easier access. Um, access shouldn't be, you know, an aspiration. Access should be ground level this is here for everybody so it, it shouldn't be you know like a milestone that you hit oh well now it's available to this group of people or that group of people no like you should start with access as the baseline and, in my opinion. and some stories are better visually uh because they're sometimes get giving a visual because some of some of us have vivid imaginations and these descriptions actually will resonate in the mind's eye and some people, I've heard, I've heard this, actually don't have their mind's eye, so they can't actually visualize it unless you show it to them. So they miss, they miss some of the richness of the world if it isn't a visual medium of some sort. So yeah, uh, visual mediums are definitely very, very important as well. Um, did I read that you on your website that you you actually have some? Or, You've signed a deal for uh, the Nightmareverse for, for Yes, uh, um, that was fun. It was the option for the TV show. Um, everybody's always like, what's happening with that? And I'm like, well, I COVID. don't know. Um, I never know anything because okay. when you do stuff like that, you are literally signing away. Somebody else is gonna do their version of it. Um, mm -hmm. When stuff starts to happen is when I find out. Sometimes, maybe, um, but yeah. It could yeah, be in a couple of years, it, or it could be in 10 years. It could be- Very, whenever. very true. Um, or, it could, or it could just sit there and languish the other day with them having the rights and never actually get made, which people don't understand that aspect of selling rights. Yeah, Sometimes. or they'll revert, and then you go and do other things. Like, there's so much happens with rights outside of that's like people don't like talking about it until like it gets off the ground and it starts going because we don't have answers i would love to be able to say like say everything that's happening i don't know i would but love you, to know but do you I have a clause where you get to be do you get to consult on it when they do finally do it or did you sign up it'd be or? nice um I have that ability availability to do so uh whether or not that will happen is not up to me so it, it literally is, it's the same with like some authors and their covers. Like I was very heavily involved in the covers for the books. I got to choose the cover model. Um, they sent me comps and I got to say, I like that about this cover and I like that about this cover. Can we bring those two together? And ultimately that led to how we have A Blade So Black, the cover that we have now. Um, for all of them, I you know, they asked questions and I gave input and they took it very seriously. Um, and then some authors, they get a picture, they're like, here's your cover, it's going live tomorrow. Like it honestly depends on the team responsible because I legally don't have, to, I don't get a say in my cover, but my team was very respectful for what I was trying to do with the story and what I was trying to do with wanting a black girl on the cover of an adventure book. Um, so I was very involved. It could have been easily the opposite. So it could go many multiple ways with any adaptation, um, wherein the only thing I have control of a hundred percent are the words on the page. Everything else is ultimately someone else's decision. So yeah. I'm, as long as I'm happy with the words on the page, they're not going anywhere with no matter what happens. And I hope that people keep that in mind, not only just with my books, but with all books in general. Like the only thing the author has control over is the words on the page. Now, maybe if you get to Stephen King levels, they'll let you make changes to scripts and things like that. But most of the time the author gets, they're like, here are the episodes have fun <laughs> that's literally what happens um sometimes you get more involvement sometimes you don't um but it we're not we can't make that decision so i i, I know some authors get more input than others obviously uh with the harry potter franchise rowling got a lot of control over 
and say over what happened in in the movies, which is is an exception rather than the rule. Very much an exception. Where, where even though Terry Brooks was a consultant for the Shannara Chronicles, some of the choices they made, you, know, you just sat there and shook your head and went, oh. oh, it's the same with like Game of Thrones. Like I'm sure he was consulted, but at the end of the day, the people in charge get to do what they want. Finish. They did, They just went where they wanted to, uh, which I guess is also something that happens in anime. If if manga and anime are run, running si simultaneously and one gets behind, the people doing the visual, well, well, this just we're going to take the story this way, and which they are legally allowed to do. Yeah, yeah, because they they've got the rights for that story they, for it, and so yeah, they they can if the author hasn't given them a blueprint. They can just take it the way they want it. Or and even if they have. Like, yeah, you'll have you books. You can still take it whichever way you want it. That the book has been around for however long, and then somebody mm -hmm. comes along and makes a movie, and all they have in common is the title and the name of the characters. Like, oh. that is it. Well, not even the name of the character, but uh, uh, Beastmaster comes to mind. Um, they didn't get uh, Andre Norton's permission, so they completely changed it from a science fiction to a fantasy and changed it. But if you've actually, I've actually read the old book around the time I, the movie came uh, came out and you can see the parallels but to keep it to keep from having to pay her they kept the title they kept the fact that uh what ty uh, basic types of animals that he had and what they did and the rest bears no resemblance <laughs> so yeah, yeah it happens so yeah if should anything happen with um a blade so black I would love to be involved as much as humanly possible, but at the same time, I could not be involved at all. We will leave it up to the TV gods <laughs> and pray for the best. And, and as many people do say, yeah, it's like it didn't change a word on the page. And, and it's true, it doesn't. I know there's several authors that have, that, I, I guess it was uh, David Brin who when, when asked about one of his uh, novel treatments. He said, uh, my, my story remains the same. They didn't do a thing to the story. Because the book, the book is the book. So, yeah, the the story remains the story. The movie will be what the movie is. The TV show will be what the TV show is. And hopefully, for the fans, it actually adheres enough to it that the fans go yay rather than because <laughs> 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 that's quite often it's like. Where did they get that? And of course, the people that don't know the books are going, this is great. And everybody else is going, uh, I don't recognize that. So, well, uh, we're getting close to the end here. Um, I, uh, it's been really nice talking with you. And hopefully someday when we have a live convention, we can actually have you out for real and maybe have other guests along with you and, and do some really fun stuff. But. Um, as, as well, I've only self-published a novella and a novelette, and I've sold a couple of short stories. But and I'm working on a novel. Um, for those of those of us trying to bring in diverse casts to our uh, stories, what advice do you have for authors like me? My I ha my advice is twofold. Um, as of right now, my and I talk about this online as well on my Twitters. I scream about it often. Uh, having a diverse cast doesn't necessarily mean having writing from the viewpoint of that character. Right. Um, because right now, I could probably count on my hand the number of people who write about these characters who aren't from that background and who manage to not screw it up. Um, so, and then people, you know, so kind of get in their feelings and they're like, well, I don't want to write just this all the time. Um, my first reaction to that is, well, you just made this about what you do and don't want to do. And this is not about you. So take yourself out of the center for a second. Sometimes things could not be about you. It'll be okay. Um, and you can still have diverse secondary characters. Like that is still a possibility. You could still write this great diverse world with your secondary characters and still give them all of the care and the research and the sensitivity that you would give a point of view character. Um, I would just caution people to stay away from the point of view characters for one, uh, just because it's, it doesn't go right. It just, it just right. like numbers wise and looking at, you know, just 
from a scientific standpoint, the odds of you getting it right are very, very minuscule and the odds of it going sideways are astronomically high. So just save yourself the heartache as well. Also, just from the standpoint, um, like I was talking about, of the books in just two years ago, there were four of us, you know, publishing has this thing where they will connect to the character if it's written by a white author more than they will if it's written by a uh, black author. Well, I've gotten and other authors have gotten, you know, it's not black enough because it doesn't fulfill certain stereotypes. You know what I'm saying? Um, or it's, you know, it, I don't connect to the character. Well, you haven't had to connect to characters who don't look like you for your entire life. So you're out of practice. But by, um, if it's from a white author, it still has that, you know, connection. And so they can kind of connect that way. Um, so if it comes down to a book written by a black author or a book written by a white author, nine times out of 10, the one by the white author is the one that's gonna be chosen. So that book is literally taking space away from a black author. I don't like it, it sucks, I wish it wasn't like that, but them's the breaks because that's the world that we live in. Um, so that's why on second fold, I'm always, I caution people against it because you will take that spot from a black author. Um, it's not your fault, but it will still happen and you'll still be party to it. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, pepper your world with diverse characters because that's the world that we live in. Don't write from that point of view. Um, and whatever character you do write, do it carefully and with love and care. Um, do it as if you were writing that character from that point of view. And you'll be as close to uh, getting it as possible. Also, um, be prepared to not get it and don't look for anybody to give you permission to do the thing because I'm going to say no. <laughs> don't ask me I'm just gonna tell you no don't ask anybody permission if you have to ask for permission you're not ready to do the thing right so my 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 current science fiction piece that I am writing does have a diverse cast my main my point of view character is white although male and uh his love interest is a uh, black woman but I have actually run her through one of my uh one of the, the scene where they meet through at least one friend who is a, a black woman and she was laughing. She, she loved it. And I, I plan on actually, as, as this develops, running it past more sensitivity readers because I get things from an outside. So I hear tones. I, I know body languages from my point of view. But even as a secondary character, even though I'm not into it, I've got to make sure that she and the others are true to the reactions and stuff that they will have. So I do plan on using sensitivity readers yeah. because I, I fully expect I'm going to screw something up even with a secondary character without input from the other people. And I hope others realize this too. And it, it, it's not a criticism of us. It's we have to learn to write characters that aren't us. And like you said, you, you guys are already, your whole media and everything is already our world as well. So you already know where we're, where we're coming from because we throw it in your face everywhere. All the time, all day, every day. <laughs> I had to grow up knowing it. So I am I am fluent in it. I honestly know it better than some people who actually live in that system. So it's a means of survival. Like I have to know it inside and out. I can't make mistakes or it costs me something. So it's very like, that, that's a whole other conversation. And one day I'll probably get into it live. Well, I don't know. But that that's my thing is don't look for permission. You're not gonna get it. And even if somebody gave it to you, it doesn't count. So somebody else is going because and, and no matter how careful we are, we're all go, all of us are going to offend somebody with our stories. It's not going to resonate with somebody because people are all different. So we, we just got to do the best we can, all of us, to create stories that everybody can enjoy or the, mo the majority of people can enjoy. Because, again, we're, we're not going to please everybody, obviously. So. Um, we're coming to the end of this. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. I'm so sorry we had uh, all of our little glitches, but being the first we got time it done. <laughs> being this is the first time we've done this play, uh, uh, yeah, we <laughs> Melissa, you're on your mic. Sorry. <laughs> We're all learning how to do do this in in, in the world of COVID. Um, 
we've been dealing with technology for all these years and we're having to learn to use it in new ways and all, and all the funny things that can crop up as we try this. So again, thank you so much, Al, for uh, joining us. And again, when we actually get to have a live Condor Conduct, I would love to have you back and with other people so we, we can do multi-panels and you get to actually interact with all of us. So. Thank you for joining us as our guest of honor. And you follow in some really good footsteps because although I didn't get to attend, attend our first Condor because I had a small one and I was kind enough not to bring my child to conventions that were small, <laughs> Octavia Butler was one of our first guests, was our first guest uh, for literary. So you follow in some great footsteps. Thank you again for joining us, and we hope to see you here live in San Diego someday. Thank you. Thank you. You have a wonderful day. You too. All right. <laughs>